What do you all think about him? <laughs> oh, my goodness, yes. Can't even see over that thing. <laughs> Me and John, I mean, we got to have small pulpits, don't we, John? <laughs> Uh, well, if you'll turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 18. John's Gospel, chapter 18. It is such a blessing to be here. And last night, I, I woke up during the night thanking the Lord for what we heard last night. I, and one thing that John said that I told him a little while ago, I said, you know, that... Our faith doesn't make the death of Christ effectual. And it doesn't. Whether you're a believer or not believer, nothing we'll ever do that make the death of Christ effectual. Nothing we'll do that ever make the blood of Christ effectual. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And once it's applied, there's nothing you can do to undo it. Huh? All right, let me read these first 18 verses and I pray that Lord meet with us. <clears throat> when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted there with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Our Lord said unto them, I am. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Again our Lord answers, I told you that I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which, we spake, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me. I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink it? Our Lord Jesus, in every place you find him, everywhere you see him, in the scriptures, you get a revelation of his character, just a greater revelation of his character, of his blessed person. And that's what we want to see. We want to see revelations of his power, his grace, his mercy, and his blessed person. Never been a person on this earth like him. And never will, never, you know, he was the most blessed person that was ever lived on this earth. And wherever he was, in whatever situation he was in, his personality, which was so unique, it could not be hid. You can't hide it. And when he saw a multitude that was hungry, you know what he did for them? Sit down, and I'll feed you. I'll feed you. And when he heard the cry of a beggar, have mercy on me, our Lord Jesus Christ stopped stood still, commanded him to call him over here to me. And he gave him his sight. And when our Lord looked on the fields, he said, these fields, look at these fields, they're white, ready to be harvested. And he said, I pray, he said, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the field. And that's what he men need. They need somebody to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we read the scriptures, and listen to me now, as we read, when we read the scriptures, that's where we hear his voice. It's from his word where we hear his voice. If he's going to speak to us, he's going to speak through his word. He ain't going to give us no visions. 
He ain't going to send no angels to talk to us. He's going to speak to us through his word. And his word, and you begin to see, when you see him in the word and hear his blessed voice, you begin to see what a wonderful, wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord. And oh, what a wonderful, wonderful Savior he is to me. And his wonderful, wonderful character, his blessed person, is opened up before our eyes of faith. And oh, what a blessed thing is to see our Lord Jesus Christ. And here in these verses that I read this morning, I want to look at just a few glimpses, just a few glimpses of our Lord Jesus Christ in the garden and hopefully see some revelations of his character. I want you to look in verse 2. You know, our Lord, when he went forth into the garden, we know what garden it was, and it says Judas, which also betrayed him, knew that Jesus, that knew the place for Jesus also, oftentimes there resorted with his disciples. You know why our Lord went into the garden? This is not the first time he went into the garden of Gethsemane. He went there oftentimes, and he oftentimes went there and took his disciples, and he went there to pray. Our Lord was a praying man. You know, one time it talks about he prayed all night. In fact, here John 17 is a whole prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ prayed. When it said he spake these words, he's talking about the words of this prayer in John 17. And he had a, and he had a place that he went to prayer. He went up on a mountain to pray. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and that's what he went in there to do to pray. And he had three disciples with him. You remember that? And those three disciples, they fell asleep while our Lord was praying. Could you imagine falling asleep hearing the Lord Jesus Christ praying? Could you imagine doing that? Yes, I can. You know why I can? Because I know flesh. I know human nature. And I tell you what, it ain't, it ain't worth spit, as old Scott Richardson said. That's what flesh is. And I tell you, them fellas fell asleep. And our Lord Jesus praying. He got up and told them, wake up. Can't you watch with me? Yeah, yeah, we'll wake up. We'll wake And they went right back to sleep in a little while. Right back to sleep. But oh my. And when he had spoken these words, but here he came to the Garden of Eden. I mean the Garden of Gethsemane, excuse me. He came to the Garden for his personal prayer to pour out his heart before his father. And then I want to show you something here. What a solemn, solemn warning for us. There in verse 2 it said, Judas also which betrayed him knew the place. He knew exactly where the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be on this night. He knew exactly where he was going to be. Now let me tell you something. That's a solemn warning. You know, he had been a companion for our Lord for three years. He heard our Lord preach. He ate with our Lord. He went out and done miracles. He done a lot of things. But he was a son of perdition. And I tell you, he saw our Lord's miracles, had his private instruction, professed himself to be a believer. And I tell you what, and here's what happened was, and every time you hear Judas's name mentioned, it's always Judas which betrayed him. There's three men that every time they're mentioned in the Bible, they, they have something special about them. Judas, every time his name's mentioned in the scriptures, Judas, which also betrayed him. And then there's Nicodemus, every time he's mentioned, he which came to Jesus by night. And John, when he's mentioned, it's always that disciple whom Jesus loved. Those three men are always identified by those things. I'd like to be identified just as a believer. That'd suit me fine. Oh, and, then, and I'd love to be one of those ones, you know, we talk about our love for Christ, but oh, I have more and more comfort of him loving me because my love for him or anybody on this earth won't even compare nothing. I could, I could not love him the way he deserves to be loved. But oh my, let me tell you, so that's why, that's why the, David said, Lord, what is man? What is man? What is he that you would even think about him? Consider him. What is he? 
Look up at the stars and I see them and I see the moon. He said, what in the world is man that you would even look at his direction? And oh, Judas, which betrayed him. And I tell you what, one little leak could ship a whole ship. And look what else it says about our master. In verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth. You know, our Lord, he had perfect knowledge of everything. Perfect knowledge of everything. I was preaching a week or so ago, and, and he, he told his disciples, when he's getting ready to go into Jerusalem as the king, right on that coat, he told his disciples, now, there's a street, and when you get to that street, you're going to find a coat. And he said, and you go there, and when you find that coat, you loosen him. And the man's going to ask you, what in the world are you taking that coat for? And our Lord said, I tell you, this is what you tell him. He said, the Lord hath need of him. And you bring him to me. Now, how in the world did our Lord know where that coat was? What would be said when they got there? And what would be done? That's what I'm telling you about. Ours not anything that our Lord don't know. He has perfect, right now, this moment in time, our Lord knows every thought that's going through our brain right now and everything that we think, every motive, every action we do. Now you say, that scares me. It don't me. Lord, I'm open. <laughs> open it up. Look, look, look. And all, oh, listen, you know what he's going to see? He's going to see himself. He's going to see his own righteousness. He's going to see his own power. He's going to see his own grace. He's going to see his own mercy. He's going to see what he did for me. Nothing I ever did for him. That's what he's going to see. Huh? Oh, my. And our Lord, and here's what happened. When he said, knowing all things is going to come upon him, our Lord went forth to see, to see and guarantee that all things would be fulfilled concerning himself. I, he knew. He said, my hour's not yet come. You know, when our Lord went forth, he went forth to see that everything that was said about him would be accomplished and would be fulfilled. The hour has come. The hour has come. And our Lord is not hiding from his enemies. He knew that Judas was going to come. He knew that Judas would be there. And you know, over here in John 13, look what it says. 13, one, just excuse me, 13, Three, talking about Christ knowing all things. John 13, 3. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Everything was given into his hands. And over here, not only says all things given in his hands, but here it says all things. Jesus knowing, therefore, all things that should come upon him. You know, there he said all things is in his hands. Here he is, he's emptying himself. Here he is, divesting himself. Here he is. He went forth. Look what it says there in verse 4. And all things that come upon him, he went forth. He went forth. What did he go forth for? Since all things was in his hand, he went forth to be despised and rejected of men. He went forth to be despised and rejected. He went forth to be wounded for our transgressions. He went forth to be bruised for our iniquities. He went forth for God to put chastisement for our peace upon him. He went forth as a lamb led to the slaughter. He went forth to be cut off out of the land of the living. He went forth to make his soul an offering for sin. He went forth to be our lamb. To be went forth to be our substitute. He went forth to bear our sin. He went forth to face God for our wrath and our judgment. And our, oh, he went forth. And he went forth to all of those things. They say, we're going to take him. No, they didn't take him. He went forth. There they are, a big crowd. And it says they had lights and, ten and weapons. Why do you need a weapon against somebody that never did anything to anybody? Why would you need a weapon against Christ? That meek, 
man, that lovely man, that compassionate man, that Savior who needs a, who needs a weapon against the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he went forth to the agony of betrayal, went forth to the shame of becoming a prisoner and having a purple robe put on him, crown of thorns put on his head. He went forth to be treated as a common criminal, went forth to be spit on in his face, went forth to be slapped, went forth to be mocked, went forth to be derided, and he went forth to the humiliation of being left to the devices of the most wicked men. And yet the last thing he said before he said it's finished, he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't have a, any idea what they're doing right now and who they're doing it to. Don't have any idea. And oh my and Jesus knowing, it said there again in verse 4, Jesus knowing all things that should come upon him, his knowledge was perfect. There were no surprises. He had no surprises. He knew his suffering, and he went forth to endure them. And when it says, our Lord knowing all things, all things, oh my, all things decreed by God Almighty. Let me just say something about the decree of God. We talk about decrees, but there's only one decree. One decree. He declared the end from the beginning. One decree. He don't have decrees. God don't have to say, well, I'll decree this for that day and that this. Day. Everything from, from way back yonder to way out yonder, he declared the end from the beginning. And oh, my and I tell you, he, did, he went forth to all things decreed of God, all things agreed upon in the eternal covenant of grace, and all things predicted in the Old Testament scriptures. Oh, it was time for him to crush the serpent's head, and the, time for our Lord Jesus Christ to be led as the lamb to the slaughter. Look over in John 19, 8. No, excuse me, John 19, 18. 28, 28, 28, 28. This is what we're talking about. And this is what knowing our Lord doing all things. After this, Jesus, and he's on the cross now. He's on the cross. He's nailed there. Blood is everywhere. And after this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. You know what he said? I thirst. You know why that? Because the Bible said that's what he'd say. And, and he's on the cross. And he, knowing all things that was going to happen. All things is fulfilled now. Give me that drink. Why are you going to give me the drink? I'm going to give you some vinegar. I'm not going to give you no sweet water. I'm not going to give you nothing that's going to make you feel good. I'm not going to give you anything that's going to comfort you or help you in any way. I'm not going to do anything to do you any good at all. I'm going to give you some vinegar. I'm not going to give you no water. Uh huh? And I tell you what, our Lord Jesus Christ, he knew all things that was predicted of him in the Old Testament. And we don't know all things, and I sure am thankful. We don't. I met people that think they know everything, but I tell you, we don't know all things. And I thank God we don't. I don't not. Somebody said, what are you going to do tomorrow? I'll know when I get up. I'll know when I get up and start. But here's the thing. We don't know all things. Thank God we don't have to. But we do know, need to know him. But we know who knows everything. And we know who orders all things. And bless his holy name. Now you may do something that surprises you. And you may do something that surprises somebody else. But you'll never do anything that surprises God. Never. Never do anything surprise him. And then look what our Lord said about himself. And there in verse 5, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 4, he said this. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. John 18, 4. He, they, <clears throat> and you know, when he went forth, he said unto them, Whom seek ye? Who are you looking for? 
You got all these people out here. Who are you looking for? And you know what they said? And Jesus, Jesus saith unto them, they said, we're looking for Jesus and Nazareth. They didn't say we're looking for the Christ. They didn't say that. We're looking for the Lord. We're looking for that deceiver. No, we're looking for Jesus and Nazareth. Just a man, a boy, man born in Nazareth. But what did he say? He said, whom seek ye? They said, we're looking for Jesus and Nazareth. How the Lord spoke two one-syllable words. I am. I am. That's all it took. I am. I am. And oh my. And look what it said in verse 6. As soon as the, he said unto them, I am, them fellas start backing up. And they bumped into fellas, and that fellow bumped into another fellow, and bumped into another fellow. Next thing you know, a bunch of them all over the ground. They're all over the ground. They're all knocked down. They're all falling all over one another. They never dreamed that somebody would walk up to them and say, dude, they're looking for Walk up to them, look them right in the eye and say, I'm right here. It's me. And they knew exactly when he said, I am what he's talking about. I am. They come to take him, and he challenges them. They didn't acknowledge him as the Christ, but as the Nazarene. That's his name of humiliation. That's the name of his reproach. Oh, it's the name of that rejected one, despised one. And oh my. And lo, he, they went backward and fell to the ground. One place it said there's over 500 people come after him. 500 people come after one man. And then he asked them again. After they got back up, these fellows got, got their... Got, got, kind of got the nerve back up again, you know, got the feeling a little better. And, and, they, and he, they came to, they asked him again. And then he asked them again, whom seek ye? And again, they said, Jesus and Nazareth. He said, I am. <laughs> you, know, you know, the first time I am was ever said. God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And that burning bush was our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing about it, you know, and, and Moses, he said, you're going to go down and tell them that I want my people to go. He said, who am I going to say sent me? Just tell them I am that I am. That's all you need to tell them, just I am that I am. Well, who's I am? Same one that was. Same one that will be. Same way it always was and always will be and never has changed. You know, that's what some people... David's talking about last night, you know, about how people think about God. But here's, here's, here's the thing. All it takes for the Lord Jesus Christ to say, I am. And I'll tell you what, he, he has never changed. He never will change. He never had to think of anything. He ain't never forgot nothing. He ain't never had to make one decision. God does everything and never moved a muscle. He created this world and never moved, just spoke. And when if he's going to save you, all he's going to do is just speak his word and he's going to speak to you and something's going to happen. That's just how, that's why our Lord is. All he's got to do is let you know I am that I am. And you know what you'll do? You'll do just exactly like Moses. God said, take off your feet, you're on holy ground. You know what you'll do? You'll say, oh Lord, oh Lord. You'll fall down before him. You'll fall down before him. And oh my Instead of falling down before him and worshiping him, they fell backwards. Oh, you're talking about a display of majesty, a display of power, a display of his quiet exhibition of his power, just saying, I am. And that power has such force that it made people back up, back up. His enemies back up. And you know what it does for us? It makes us want to get close. <laughs> We want to get close. We want to get close. But why in the world did our Lord act this way? Why did he act this way? When they come seeking Jesus and Nazareth, he acted this way, said that I am, to show us clearly, clearly, that he was God Almighty, that he was God manifested in the flesh. All could clearly, clearly see that what they're doing, they're not coming to take him. He is voluntarily, voluntarily going before them. They, 
He's actually delivered into their hands instead of him being delivered into his hand, their hands. Oh, my. They didn't apprehend him. He submitted himself to them. He was not captured. He gave himself up. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, no man takes my life from me. I've got the power to lay it down. I've got the power to take it up again. He said, that's what I've got. Look over with me in John chapter 7. I want you to see a couple of things about our master over here. Talking about our Lord and how people treated him and how he treated them. They come to capture him, and I'll tell you what, they all fell down. Instead of worshiping him, they fell against him, <clears throat> from him. <clears throat> what is said in verse 32, John 7. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things <clears throat> concerning him, that he done miracles, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Well, now look down here in verse 44. <clears throat> they sent these men to take the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of them would have taken him. Now see, they come to get him here. Some of them would have taken him. But no man laid hands on him. And that's the same situation here. <clears throat> and then the chief priests and officers said to him, said, why have you not brought him? You know why? He said, nobody ever talked like that man did. I've never heard anybody say anything like him. And that's exactly the way those fellows acted. I never heard anybody come out and face his enemies and say, here I am. It's me. You want me? Come on, get me. You know why? Because Jesus, knowing all things as you come upon him, huh? he has power over his enemies. It's like John said last night, what God, God's going to do what he wants to do, and he ain't going to ask our permission or nobody else's. And I tell you, he has power over his enemies. He can fell, he fell these fellows with just I am. He can fell a man with a word. He can fell a man with a look. After Peter had denied him three times, and our Lord Jesus was being led out, going over to Pilate, he looked back, and there was Peter. And he looked back, and he looked at Peter. And when he looked at Peter, you know what happened to Peter? He just looked at him. Peter went out and wept and wept and wept and wept and wept and wept and wept. Just Christ just looked at him. That just looked at him. And oh my, he could have sent these men to hell as easy as they fell to the ground. It's kind of like Cor and Dathan, you know, when they decided that they was as holy as everybody else and they had as much authority as Moses did in them. And God said, oh no, you don't. He said, I'm going to open up. He said, old Barner said, I'm, he opened up hell and sent the, opened up the earth, sent them to hell without giving them an opportunity to pack their suitcases. And that's what God could have done to this outfit right here. Oh, my. He could have, he could have, he could have left them right there, walked away, and left them laying on the ground, left his enemies without anything to say. They come, thought he was at their mercy, but really, they were at his mercy. They were subject to his power. Huh? Oh, they lay there helpless on the ground. He could have destroyed them right then and there, but he didn't. Our Lord did not come to walk away. And thank God he didn't. Thank God he didn't. Then look what he says here. In verse 8. <clears throat> Back over in our text. <clears throat> our Lord, he said, they said, Jesus and Nazareth. And Jesus answered, said, I told you that I am. I told you that I am. And look what he says about his own people. He said, I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go. <laughs> you can't have me and him at the same time. Having loved his own, he loved them right to the very end. Oh, if you seek me, let these go. He loved his own. Oh, how he loves his people. How he loves his people. Oh, Paul said, having loved me and gave himself for me. 
Oh, we as his, God gave us to him in the covenant of grace. Christ came to you here and bought us with his own precious blood. Bought us and saved us by his power. You read it this morning. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest. That's a wonderful thing. Election is a wonderful thing. But just election is not enough. You know what he says? And causes to approach unto me. If he chooses you and you want his elect, you know what he's going to do? He's going to cause you to be brought unto him. I'm going to tell you something. When I, you know, it says over there in John 6, 44, no man can come unto me except my father which sent me draw him. You know what that word draw means? Same word as drag. <laughs> and our Lord dragged, dragged me all you want to. And I'm grateful that he got a hold of me. And, you know, you see somebody get a hold of somebody's coat and drag them around. Lord, get me, go ahead and get me and drag me, drag me, drag me. And I'm glad he got a hold of me and drug me to himself. And you know what? He ain't never let go. <laughs> Did he drag you? Huh? We call it irresistible grace. In fact, you're calling. Call it whatever you want to. But when he needs for you to come, you're coming. <laughs> Oh, down home people used to say, boy, turn loose of that bitch and let Jesus have his way with you. Listen, he's going, that bitch ain't going to stop you from saving you. You don't, you don't own his life. You don't own anything you want to. And I'll tell you what, he means to call you and bring you to himself. He's, you're cunning. And i tell you what, everybody that he's ever done that for, they think, Oh, God, thank you. Blessed be your name. I'm so thankful that you did. Oh, my. I wasn't even conscious of God Almighty. But boy, he is always conscious of me. And one day, one day he got me by the nap of the neck. And oh, he brought me to his self, brought me to his feet, brought me to his mercy, brought and brought his mercy to me and brought his grace to me and brought his love to me. Brought his pity to me. And oh, brought everything that I need. He brought it to me. And you know what he's still doing? Still doing the same thing day in and day out for me. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing that anybody saved. Oh, it's an amazing thing that he saved me. Oh, thank God for his power. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his mercy. And thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. <laughs> and our Lord here, his thoughts are not about himself, but his own. His own. He didn't think about his own suffering. He's thinking about his sheep, his love for his sheep. It's the shepherd protecting his sheep. He said, I'm going to suffer. But you got to let these go. You know why I had to let them go? Because our Lord has to tread the winepress alone. He has to bear the judgment of God alone. He's got to purge our sins by himself. And the la you think about this, the last thing they would remember about our master was that he, before he was ever taken as a prisoner, their love, his love for them, you got me, you can't take these. And that's exactly what God says. He got Christ, he got to let us go. He got God's wrath so we get God's mercy. He got God's judgment so we could get God's grace. He got God's hatred for sin so that we could have the love of God shown to us. Oh, my. And here our Lord doesn't act like a captive. You know what? He actually commands these men. Let these go their way. Take me, but let these go. Let these go their way. You got me. It's not just for me to suffer and them suffer, me suffer in their stead and them go. They, oh, my, they can't suffer with him. He has to enter into the holiest of holies by himself. 
And oh my. And then let me show you this. <clears throat> Look what he says down in verse 11. Look at his submission to his father's will. He had his love for his own. Look what he says. After Peter drew his sword and going to try to defend Christ, and uh, he said, put up your sword and listen to this. The cup, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink it? Look at his submission to the father's will. He submits himself to man and to God. Here's his perfect supremacy. Got the power. Everybody sees there. He's got this power. This great, great. He's supreme over everybody that's there. And yet he turns around and in perfect submission and subjection. He's, he submits to these men. He subjects himself to men. And yet he, he, he subjects himself to God Almighty. His submission to God. Here we are, he is, here's the sovereign and yet the servant. Here's the lion and the lamb. And our Lord said, the cup, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Shall I not drink it? He doesn't say a necessity is laid upon me to drink this cup. He doesn't say, my father commanded me to drink it. But he says it's like this. Would you think for a moment that I wouldn't? Shall I not drink this cup? Shall I not drink this cup? And oh my. I don't know what was in that cup. I don't know what was in that cup. I don't, you know, I, I can surmise but whatever it was, our Lord was willing to drink it. If it was God's wrath, he's going to drink it. If it's God's judgment, he's going to drink it. If it's our sins, he's going to drink it. If it's our hatred, it's our animosity, if it's our enmity, he's going to drink it. Oh, shall I not drink it? Oh, our Lord's heart. Oh, our Lord's heart here shows his heart. Shows his spirit. Shows us he didn't know how to do anything, anything other, other than to do what his father willed for him to do. He couldn't help but do it. And that's the highest willingness that can ever, ever possibly be. And he submitted to father and his cup. And shall, you know, shall I not drink it? And let me say this, and I'm through. What a lesson. What a lesson our Lord teaches us here. He said, my father gave me this cup. My father gave me this cup. My father gave it to me. My enemies never did. My father gave me this cup. And I'm going to drink it. I'm going to drink it. I'm going to drink it down, and I'm going to drink the dregs at the bottom of it. I'm going to do that. And every once in a while, God will put a cup in our hand. He'll put a cup in our hand. He'll put a cup in our hands. And I tell you, it's got some bitter stuff in it. Bitter stuff. Diagnosis from a doctor. Child being taken. My first funeral when I come to Tennessee was a six-year-old girl. Little blonde headed, blue eyed girl. Died of leukemia, six years old. Six years old. And then I preached her daddy's funeral. That little girl's daddy's funeral. He died drunk in a car wreck. But you think about putting a bitter cup, you know, I'm going to come and take your wife. I'm going to come take your husband. I'm going to come take your child. I'm going to come take your health. I'm going to make you an invalid. I'm going to put you in bed, and you're going to stay in bed the rest of your life. I'm going to do this for you. That's what I'm going to do. But if he puts it in our hands, I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll give us the grace, and he'll give us the mercy, and he'll give us the strength to take it and say, Lord, it's yours. It's your hand. 
It's your head. I, I said, you know, my wife, I love my Shirley, I love her. Oh, she's so precious to me, and she loves me, and she takes care of me, and I love her and try to take care of her. <clears throat> but when my wife Mary got sick, you know what she said, you know? She said, I'm kiss the hand of God's providence, and I'm going to live and not die. And that's the way we do. Lord, whatever you put in our hands, it's your providence. And we'll kiss your hand and bless your holy name. And we'll take it. And you know what we'll do? We'll act like we just go on. And God, you're on your throne. And we're not going to murmur. And we're not going to complain. And we're not going to let everybody know what a shape we're in. We're just going to say, Lord, it's you. And God gives us the grace to do that. He's done it for his, this man right here and done it for his wife. Oh, how many for cancer? Twice. God gave them grace, and look what they went through. Did you hear every one of them ever complain? Did you hear the one of them say, Lord, I don't think it's right you treat me that way? No, we ain't going to do God that way. God, God, God is not that way. He's not that way. And he gives us a, if he puts a cup in our hand, he don't mean for you to sip at it. He means for you to drink it. And no matter how bitter it is, you'll drink it. And you know what you'll say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. 